Hi, I'm Bob Durkin, President of the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. I'm pleased to welcome you today to our Chamber celebration of International Women's Day 2021, a day when we celebrate women throughout our community who have brought important uh, contributions to Northeastern Pennsylvania. Now, this is the point at which I really like to watch Mari Potus's face when I go off script. But I want to just mention something. Uh, at last year's program at Marywood, and thank you to Sister Mary for a great program, and aren't we all looking forward to coming together in person as well. Um, last year's program, I mentioned that the Chamber Board, some, in some circles still called the Old Boys Network, uh, had stepped over an important line a few years ago, in which we now have more women elected to the board than men. Uh, we've also reorganized, of course, in the last year, so I'm pleased to tell you right now, the makeup of our board, that Old Boys Network, is 18 women, 13 men. I think many of you here would agree it's moving in the right direction. Um, I'm also pleased to say that uh, come this May, when we reorganize, uh, Debbie Kolsovsky, Vice President of PNC Bank, will step in as the next chairperson of the Chamber Board of Directors. So that having been said, we're here for International Women's Day. And the theme of this year's program is Choose to Challenge. Choose to Challenge, which, which posits that a changed world is an alert world, and collectively we can create an inclusive world. So with that, we're proud to say that we have with us Paula McCary, publisher of Happenings Magazine, to speak about hashtag Choose to Challenge and what it means for women in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Later in the program, we'll also honor this year's Scranton Chamber Athena Award winner for some inspiring work that she has brought to this community as well. We also have Donna Barbetti, Chamber Board Member and sponsor of the Athena Award for remarks and to present the award. So I thank you again for joining us and I'm pleased right now to introduce Paula McCary. Since 1994, Paula has been with Happenings Magazine the beautiful monthly publication that features fascinating people, places, and events throughout Northeastern Pennsylvania. She has a recognized talent for writing and a tremendous passion for our region, and she uses both of those to change Northeastern Pennsylvania for the better. Paula is active in a number of community organizations and is passionate about women in business. She's a proud Marywood graduate, a former board chair of this Chamber of Commerce, and an Athena Award recipient in her own right. So with that, it's my honor to welcome Paula McCary. Thank you, Bob. It's great to be here today. It's actually great to be anywhere outside of my house, but it's especially great to be here in the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. Celebrating Women's History Day, Women's History Month, and the presentation of the prestigious Athena Award. This is an award, I am pleased to note, that is given out throughout the world to women in the United States, Canada, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere. I'd like to thank Maury Potus and the Athena Committee for inviting me to say just a few words. It's been a while since I've spoken to a group. Actually, it's been a while since I've spoken to humans outside my home at all. And I most definitely have never spoken at a virtual event before. Now, years ago, speakers were often advised to picture the audience members in their underwear. I'm not sure how picturing audience members in their underwear benefits the anxiety level of the speaker, but someone said it, someone suggested it, others repeated it, and I'm just reminding you of that today. But that thought was definitely in pre-COVID times when we might be speaking to a live audience. We all know that we sit in front of a Zoom camera with half our suits on. Um, shirts are required, but shoes aren't, and we'll just leave it at that. There's no dress code for today. What I hope is that wherever you are, you are warm, you are comfortable, you are healthy, and you are experiencing some peaceful moments. Today, we honor attorney Marion Munley, this, year, this year's recipient of the Athena Award. Marion has made her mark as a skilled and dedicated litigator and by her ardent support of numerous causes and organizations throughout the region. During the past several decades, she has committed a substantial amount of time to mentoring other young women in the legal profession. Now, I have never been in a courtroom with Marion, so I can only attest to her expertise indirectly. I have read over her 
incredibly long list of impressive accomplishments, and she is indeed abundantly worthy of this award today. But what I can tell you with precise accuracy is my firsthand knowledge, my first introduction to Marion. About 15 years ago, I was invited along with a handful of other women to Marion's house for dinner. I recall waiting in the driveway, checking my watch and my paper invitation to be sure I had the correct time and the correct location that was printed on my invitation because of course, 15 years ago, I didn't have a smartphone to help me with that. I really didn't know any of the women who were gonna be present, let alone the, ho the hostess, Mary Munley. But once inside, I discovered a very gracious person who was quite warm and welcoming. Someone who immediately erased any trepidation I may have had about fitting in. It's time to insert a quote here from a woman named Maya Angelou. I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Maya Angelou, of course, is an American poet and civil rights activist. These words are more powerful than we realize. On the surface and on a resume paper, being gracious, hospitable, and accepting toward other women, clients, employees, friends, family members, fellow citizens, particularly those people who may not think, act, look, behave, or practice the same beliefs as we do, really is at the basis of several of the hot button topics today. Isn't it true? How do we actually react to people and, to, and accept people of different religions, educational backgrounds, physical abilities or disabilities, ethnicities, income levels, or some big ones right now, race or political affiliation? How do we promote graciousness, kindness, hospitality, understanding, acceptance? How do we drive home that how we make someone feel, if how we make someone feel is the quality that we're going to re be remembered for, if this is true, how can we forget it so often? Why is it so difficult to remember? How is the concept botched up? Sometimes I read, I think if I would just post these words on my wall and I read them every hour, I, may, I might achieve this at the end of the day. I might understand every hour that how I make others feel is most important. If we were to remember this on a personal, business, national and global level, how would the world look differently? How would something like social media look differently? A few weeks ago, <clears throat> I ran an experiment on my Facebook page. On President's Day, I posted a photo of Abraham Lincoln with a quote about a divided house being unable to stand. And most of us know this quote, while it was used by Abraham Lincoln, was not actually crafted by him. It was taken from an ancient book that some of us may have in our homes today, or we have access to, we all have access to on the internet. I asked my friends if they had any comments on this quote, but they had to strive to remain unbiased. I wondered how long it would take before someone would not be able to control himself or herself and jump in with a derogatory comment. I was encouraged. It took at least three days before an inflammatory comment appeared, which I promptly erased. <clears throat> but I was delighted <clears throat> to find some introspective comments that discussed everything from the importance of the structural engineering of a house and how that relates to life, to how we need to step outside of our generational comfort zones, generational comfort zones. Now, I'm a lover of lyrics from ancient hymns to even a few rap songs and poetry, proverbs, and quotes that really sum up how I feel about a particular topic. I like to think about ancient philosophers that I studied about at Marywood University and how they studied us as humans. I wonder how these same philosophers, ancient, ancient hymn writers and poets would write about us now. Would the underlining struggles look the same, just with more current situations and details? Are the underlining stressors that cause us to forget that how we make others feel, that how we make others feel is paramount? Are they the same stressors faced by our ancestors? Now, Mary and Munley and I have at least one mutual friend, and I texted. One of, her, one of our mutual friends a few weeks ago. And I asked her to quickly text me back, don't think about it, quickly text me back three words that she felt best described Marion based on her relationship with her. And the words that this friend came up with were humble, dedicated, and caring. 
I personally would add genuine and easygoing based on my interactions with Marion. I really love and admire these qualities. There's something that I aspire to, but fall short of daily. It's interesting to think that these types of attributes must be assimilated or concluded by someone else about us. We cannot certify on a resume, I am dedicated or I am humble. How is that even quantifiable? Despite all of our daily shortcomings, mistakes and imperfections, what character qualities rise to the top? It's also interesting to recognize that there are always going to be differing opinions about us. No one is viewed exactly the same by everyone. In recent years, I've been intrigued observing how character develops over a lifetime. We can hardly describe a screaming newborn as humble or caring. No, we come into the world quite selfish, screaming, struggling to survive, and expressing our displeasure and discomfort every hour on the hour, just to ask any parent of a newborn. By the time we arrive on the playground, we have hopefully learned that the world is about more than having our own needs met, and it might be helpful to align ourselves with others. This is where it gets tricky, and where things like acceptance, acceptance and preference and even bias begins. Are the boys on one side of the playground and the girls on the other? Is anyone left out of a group? Is there whispering? Is there whispering going on? It's one of my biggest peeves. Of course, we all know exactly what takes place on playgrounds because sometimes it continues right up to social media and so forth. Are all biases and pref preferences wrong? I believe that there are some that are there for our protection and safety. For example, as a child, I would probably clear steer of anyone playing with knives on the playground. I think the most important aspect that we have to realize is that naturally we all do indeed have preferences that can lead to biases. Now, as Bob mentioned, the theme for International Women's Day 2021 is choose to challenge. When I first heard the theme, I groaned. Honestly, I thought, haven't we faced enough challenges during the past 12 months? I initially interpreted and imagined this choose to challenge theme as women's marches and protests and thought, that's not me. While I appreciate those who go to battle on the front line, I think of myself more in a communication tent, supporting others who are fighting because someone has to take care of those who are fighting the battle. My mother empowered me in many ways, although how she did that may not look like the face of a women's organization today. In a way, I consider myself an accidental feminist. During the past two and a half decades of my own career, I have on many occasions found myself to be the only female in a particular boardroom. And while I was and am somewhat exhilarated to be in that position, I wasn't exactly sure how I got there. I made a note of a comment made by Vice President Kamala Harris when she was running for Attorney General. I didn't want this position because I was a woman, she said. I wanted it because I thought I could do a great job. And that resonates with me personally quite a bit. I've always admired many of the topics and quotes written about by Sheryl Sandberg, but I always challenged one that I heard. It goes like this. Next time you hear a girl called bossy, take a deep breath and say, that girl's not bossy, she has executive leadership skills. And I know that quote was intended to prevent women from being afraid to speak up, but I always took it as the opposite. Are girls or women who do more listening than talking considered not leadership material? Is there a bias that equates more vocal women as being stronger, bolder, or more empowered? In 2010, I was completing, I think it was about 2010, I was completing a two-year term on the board of the Scranton Chamber of Commerce. After one of the meetings, Austin Burke and the current chair, I think it was Pete Danchek, asked if they could speak with me after for a few minutes. My heart began to pound because I was certain they noticed that I typically did a whole lot more listening than talking. I thought they were going to ask me to resign because I simply wasn't talking enough. But much to my surprise, I was asked to serve as board chair, a position that had only been held once before by a female. While I was flattered, in retrospect, what I am most appreciative of is the fact that no past board chair had ever represented a company of my size prior to that. A quote that echoes this fact comes from Martina Navratilova, a former professional tennis player and coach. She's considered one of the all-time greats. Labels are for filing. Labels are for clothing. Labels are not for people. 
With regard to empowering women, challenge all stereotypes and labels. We as women can and should approach our empowerment from a variety of different perspectives. We are all going to look and sound differently. Let's not label. There was a very famous woman in history who said, I don't mind living in a man's world as long as I can be a woman. I'm not sure how this quote resonates today with the International Women's Day Organization. It most likely sounds like the antithesis of the choose to challenge theme, but let's just do that. Let's challenge it. This particular famous woman greatly influenced the career of Ella Fitzgerald, who was banned because of her race from playing in popular nightclubs in the 1950s. The nightclub owner was personally called by Marilyn Monroe herself, who said to him, if you book Ella immediately, the press will go wild and your nightclub will become more successful. Of course, this is exactly what happened and prompted Ella to write of Marilyn Monroe. She was an unusual woman, a little ahead of her times, and she didn't know it. Let's empower all women to do as Martina Navratilova suggested, save the labels for clothing. A few years ago, I became very intrigued by a show called Love is Blind. Couples attempted to find true love and date without ever seeing each other. Race, age, religious beliefs, political preference, past sexual preferences, all came into play. It reminds us of the question, is there more that connects us than divides us once we eliminate preferences and biases? I suppose we attempt to do that with blind job searches, but somehow I still think things like age, sex, abilities, disabilities, just to name a few, come into play. So as I rethought the theme choose to challenge, I guess I kind of liked it. It prompted me to realize that we actually have a lot more pondering to do. We need to acknowledge that we all naturally have preferences that can lead to biases. How do we challenge ourselves? I get a kick out of people who begin posts with the words, now anyone who knows me knows that I don't have a bias bone in my body. Let's all instead recognize what our biases and preferences are so that we can indeed choose to challenge them. It's not a coincidence that I began with a Maya Angelou quote reminding us that how we make other, others feel is truly paramount. I'm going to conclude with another Angelou quote that says, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Choose to challenge yourself. The Athena Award, of course, is named after the Greek goddess of wisdom. Congratulations once again to the very outstanding attorney Marian Munley on her achievement. Thank you. My name is Donna Barbetti, and I'm honored to be here to present the Athena Award, the 2021 Award. Athena Leadership Award rather goes to attorney Marion Munley. Marion has made her mark in the male dominated area of trucking law for more than 30 years. Chosen as the recipient by a committee of her peers, Marion embodies the character of the Athena Award, not only for her success in some of Pennsylvania's largest and groundbreaking legal victories, but also thanks to her dedication to the community local organizations, and for being a role model and a mentor to other women in law. Marion has provided free legal services to those in need and has supported the Lackawanna Pro Bono for more than 20 years. She also sponsors scholarships at the University of Scranton, Marywood University, and Johnson College. Furthermore, Marion mentors young women aspiring for a career in law, particularly at Munley Law, she is available for advice, questions, and ensures that they have a role in the firm's big cases. Now, before I present the award, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the lineage of strong women from which Marion descends. Her grandmother, Mary Munley, her, name, her namesake was the first female representative in the state legislature. Her other grandmother, Mrs. Muir, was a successful business owner of Muir, uh, Muir, Muir Sweet Shop. Both of them were very, very strong. In turn, they raised a strong daughter who then in turn raised Marion. So without further ado, I would like to present the award. It is my privilege and my honor to present the 2021 Athena Award to Marion Munley. 
Now, Marion, would you kindly present a few words to us? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Donna, and thank you, Paula, um, President Durkin, members of the selection committee, our sponsor, Donna and Michael Barbetti, past honorees, members of the chamber, fellow nominees, and family and friends. It is my great honor to receive the Athena Award and to be with you today on International Women's Day. And today I honor those women who came before me, women who at great personal sacrifice and risk paved the way for me and my sisters in the law, in medicine, in politics, in business, in education and all other fields. And my success um, as an attorney is certainly due because of the women who came before me in the law and paved the way. It was mentioned at the beginning that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a uh, Athena Leadership Award winner. And Ms. Uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, of course, graduated first in her class from law school and could not get a job. Um, she said there were three things that were preventing her from getting a job. One was that she was a woman. Uh, second uh, was that she was a mother. And uh, third was that, you know, she, it was thought that she was taking away her male counterpoint jobs. So to be in the company of such distinguished um, award winners, including our own award winners um, from the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce, all women that I admire. Um, so I am really very deeply humbled. I said when I received the award, when Maury Cotis came to my office and shocked me <laughs> with, um, she had a lot of balloons and flowers and, um, you know, I was certainly in a state of shock when I received it, but I said to her that, you know, if I'm, if I'm able to do anything, it's because I stand on the shoulder of giants, um, those women who came before me and paved the way. And as Donna said, um, I come from a family of strong women. Um, years ago, I gave a speech to the chamber uh, about women and women in Pennsylvania. And I said then, and I'll say now that, you know, I am so blessed to have such strong women in my family who set the bar high for me and my sisters. Of course, my grandmother, Marion Munley, who was very active in politics, she was a single woman. Um, she, when she began her career, she was one of three women in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. And in 1959, she sponsored the Equal Pay Act with three women. And it was groundbreaking at the time. It was one of the first Equal Pay Acts in the nation. It was before uh, President Kennedy um, passed federal legislation. So my grandmother was ahead of her time. She went th then went on to serve as a officer in the Democratic Caucus and in the House. She became Secretary of the House. My maternal grandmother, Bernadine Nelson Muir, also a single mother um, who worked hard every day to support her children and who did run her own business, um, believed in the power of education. And of course, my own mother, Bernadine Munley, without whom I would not be here um, and if it wasn't for her support and encouragement in every step of my career, um, it, I would be a, telling a different story. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, all I am, I owe to my angel mother. I believe it's important to continue to mentor the next generation of lawyers and hope in some small way to leave an indelible mark on that next generation, encourage them to reach their hand back and help those that come after them. I am proud to be the mother of two amazing sons, Jack and Matthew Cartwright. And of course, my husband, Matt, who is uh, here today, virtually, um, who is my cornerstone and my rock. 
and without whom I, I wouldn't be able to do what I, I did as a working mother. It's important to Matt and I that we live and work in this community and do what we can to help our friends, our neighbors and citizens. And we've tried each in our own way um, to help me through the court system and Matt through the legislative branch. It's so wonderful to receive this award um, named for the Athena, the warrior goddess and the goddess of wisdom. And you may not know, but I know my cousin Julia is here, my law partners, uh, my family who have been just uh, very strong supporters of mine. They all know that um, I am a big fan of Athena. Actually, I have several paintings of Athena pictured with her sword and her olive branch. So um, it's ironic that I have a new Athena uh, statue to bring to my office um, and to that statue is in good company with my other Athena um, uh, uh, Athena paintings and I actually have a little statue of Athena as well. So thank you again um, to the chamber and to everyone um, in my family and my law practice who have supported me and um, who have helped me all along the way. And to the next generation of women, uh, please help those that come before you like the generations um, have helped us. And hopefully like we now have a woman as vice president of the United States and hopefully in this generation, we'll see a woman president. So choose to challenge and thank you very much. Congratulations, Mary, and thank you for that wonderful um, remarks there. And thank you to Paul McCary for an amazing keynote presentation on our International Women's Day and to Donna Barbetti for being here and sponsoring the Athena Award. All three women are a true inspiration to all the women of Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I know personally grateful to know each and every one of you. And um, as we wrap up today's luncheon presentation, the luncheon without food, hopefully we will be back to normal now that this is one full year um, of our, our lovely COVID. This was the last event last year that we had in person um, before everything happened. So hopefully we'll put this all behind us and see you all very soon in person uh, when we relaunch our, our in-person events here at the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, choose to challenge and have a great day.